This is the, uh, the Public Works and Finance Committee meeting of the Moscow City Council. Today is Monday, October 12th. Happy fall to all of you. Uh, to my front and left is uh, Councillor Sandra Kelly, and to my front and right is Councillor Brandy Sullivan. I'm Gina Tarusio. Our first item is the approval of the September 28th Public Works and Finance Committee meeting minutes. I move we approve the minutes. They look good to me too. Okay, awesome. They are they are approved. Second item is our disbursement report for September of 2020. Sarah Banks, hello there. Hi, how are you? Good. All right, so looking at month ending September 30, 2020, our expenditures totaled $3,589,116. Um, actually, our total expenditures was $3,706,541. Um, but our largest major was payroll that came in at $1,152,854. We did have a couple of larger payments this month that I want to point out. We have our Well 10 Phase 2 construction contractor payment that came in at $234,748.89. We had a Regents payment for our payroll batches in September for $144,884. We purchased the Haddock building and that amount was $834,344.92. And we had a couple of new equipment and vehicles for streets, a flatbed with a hoist and a plow and spreader for a total of $349,275.57. Those are the largest expenditures, expenditures we had. Okay, committee, any questions? Nope, no surprises there. Yep. All things we were planning on. <laughs> okay, Sarah, I think we are good to sign that report then. Yes. Okay. And so just so you know, this report is currently with me remotely. So I'll have it in the office for you to come by and sign or for me to put it in your box tomorrow. Okay. Awesome. Thank whatever, you. Whatever works. All right. Okay. Our next item is an ordinance amending Title IV, Chapter 3 of Moscow City Council, or I'm sorry, Moscow City Code regarding amendments to the Telecommunications Code to establish standards for small wireless facilities. Wow, Mike Gray. Big long title. Good afternoon, counselors. Hello there, sir. So this is really just a culmination of a project uh, that uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission has been working on over the last year. This is an amendment of Title IV, Chapter 3, and this is our, in, within our existing telecommunications code. And this is regarding uh, the insertion of small wireless facility standards within the existing code. So just a little bit of background. Uh, historically, cellular communication systems were designed to transport voice communications. Uh, voice communications were easily handled with tall, pa high power communications towers, so the macro cell towers, uh, which Moscow has a few of those located around town. Uh, and then over the years, we've pretty much seen this uh, advancement in data technology. Uh, and so that technology has evolved and wireless data demand has grown. And then those legacy towers are being overwhelmed with wireless data traffic. Uh, new 5G technology uh, will be deployed, which will bring much higher data speeds and traffic. Uh, and re really, that's the intent of the 5G technology is to handle all that data demand. And then to ne meet the increased uh, need, providers are deploying these new small cell installations to accommodate the data demand, uh, which have a lot smaller uh, antenna and are located with a lot, uh, a lot closer together, so a lot more frequency, typically located in the public right away. So, looking at uh, what we've had up to this point with these larger macro cell towers, uh, here's a couple examples. We've got uh, this is the, actually the tower on the east side marketplace here on the left of your screen, and then this tower is a stealth tower uh, macro cell that's located over by uh, Baker and A Street corridors. And you also have uh, not just the freestanding towers, but we also have structure-mounted antennas as well. 
Uh, Theophilus Tower has a number of those. You can see them up towards the top of uh, that structure on pretty much all of these sides. Uh, McConnell Building downtown is another prime location uh, on Main Street. And then we also have a number of antenna uh, located on water tanks. So water towers and a lot of our city parks uh, contain this technology as well. Uh, this is just an example of what the small cell uh, poles end up looking like. Uh, you can see a lot of these are co-locations, so locating uh, antenna on top of a structure or attached to a structure that's not originally intended to accommodate the antennas, so in this case a telephone pole, a uh, utility pole, and you can see uh, kind of the before and the after. Uh, usually you have some type of equipment shroud located on the side of the pole, and then the antenna itself uh, located on the very top of the uh, pole. That's usually it, and then it connects to fiber optic, uh, usually run underground. Uh, there are other examples. Uh, these are more urban examples, so you can see a historic street light there. Uh, a lot of these are contained within the pole themselves, and these are obviously light poles uh, that have been retrofitted with the antenna on top, and that's what they would call a cantenna located on the top here, uh, as well as the top of that pole there. Just a couple other examples. This is uh, Central Park, New York City, uh, a lot smaller of an antenna protruding up from the top. And then this would just be a uh, typically what you'd look for in a freestanding small cell uh, pole, uh, but it looks like there is a light coming mast coming off of that as well. So with this comes uh, a lot of visual clutter concerns, and that's uh, been the main goal of Planning and Zoning Commission is to uh, look at controlling and regulating uh, a lot of the aesthetics with, that come along with small cells. So uh, just to recap, the existing telecommunications code does not address small cell facilities currently. Uh, looking at our program objectives uh, intended to provide reasonable access to desired services, uh, minimize that visual clutter, uh, ensure as installations are aesthetically pleasing as possible, ensure that the installations do not obstruct sidewalks and roadways, do not interfere with light fixture function, so a lot of those shrouds that are located on the side, uh, and create a permitting system that can facilitate processing of applications within the allotted time frame, and I'll get into a little bit more detail later on in the presentation about what those are. Uh, Stepping back and looking at the Telecommunications Act, and this is 1996, uh, local jurisdictions have to provide telecommunication providers reasonable access within the public right-of-way, and they cannot effectively deny their ability to provide service. So we're preempted uh, by the FCC and the Telecommunications Act in certain, in certain aspects of uh, these regulations. Uh, we're prohibited from regulating wireless communication facilities based upon radio frequency emissions and effectively prohibiting uh, delivering a telecommunication services. So uh, the FCC sets the uh, emissions threshold uh, in which uh, the cellular providers are required to abide by and local jurisdictions cannot go pretty much above and beyond that. And then in uh, September, late September of 2018, uh, the FCC issued a new ruling, and it was really intended to streamline the permitting of 5G deployments throughout the United States. Uh, the FCC ruling included maximum fees that can be charged for small cell applications, as well as right-of-way use. And then a new shot clock decision time frame for small cell applications. So, uh, it was 60 days for co-location upon existing utility poles and 90 days for new standalone small cell towers. So when the application supplemental materials are complete uh, and submitted to uh, a local government, they have these time frames that they need to process and approve the applications uh, within. And then an appeal process for shot clock violations. Looking at our existing telecommunications code, it currently does not distinguish between these larger macro cell towers that we've traditionally seen and the small cell poles. Uh, if you were to create or construct a new uh, macro cell or small cell uh, tower or pole, it would require a conditional use permit currently. Uh, Co-location, so we talked about this before, you know, placing of one or more antennas on a support structure that wasn't originally intended uh, for antenna use. Uh, that's called an antenna support structure. And so 
Uh, usually co-location is permitted throughout the city so long as it doesn't uh, exceed certain dimensional requirements and so all zoning districts as long as the antenna doesn't protrude more than 18 feet above or eight feet away horizontally from the support structure so really the small cell right now would fall under the umbrella of these current uh, regulations doesn't draw a distinction and so essentially they're allowed by right right now uh, and we don't have any design standards currently and so uh, that's really the onus for uh, putting uh, regulations in place to address uh, small cell so looking at the draft ordinance, uh, we've gone ahead and inserted a definition of what a small wireless facility is. Uh, go through small wireless facility standards. Uh, those apply to new facilities as well as co-location. And then there's three categories of installations and uh, I'd cut out quite a bit of detail on this and I'll certainly give the council uh, the full presentation where I go through all the requirements. But if you have uh, questions regarding what uh, some of the design standards are. We can certainly go through those today as well. So the three categories are co-location upon existing support structures. So that would be the utility pole, light pole, um, co-locating on, on one that already exists. A replacement of existing antenna support structures. So that would be tearing the whole structure down. So it was originally intended for a light pole. You tear the whole pole down and then you reconstruct a new one that includes possibly both light and uh, small cell facilities on, the, uh, on that one pole. And then you've got a third example of new small wireless facility antenna towers and that's just a standalone uh, completely dedicated to small wireless facilities. Uh, no other ancillary use on that uh, tower. So just kind of a visual uh, representation about those different categories. So this would be the example of the existing utility pole. Uh, typically you see the shroud on the side. There are dimensional space requirements for uh, how large those shrouds can be. Uh, usually have the fiber optic and, and electrical connections coming up from the ground. Could be additional equipment shrouds. And then you also have, uh, and this is more prevalent with some of the cable providers, uh, you do see some equipment shrouds that aren't dedicated to wireless facilities, uh, more far. Uh. Then another example of this would be the replacement combination of uh, small wireless facilities, so an antenna, as well as the light, light arm coming off. Then this would just be the standalone uh, small wireless tower. So as Planning and Zoning Commission uh, was working on this draft ordinance, uh, we did uh, tangentially have Sustainable Environment Commission uh, concerned with potential health concerns that could come uh, with small cell 5G activity in the city. And Planning and Zoning Commission did end up attending one of the meetings. So it was myself and Wendy, the chair of PNZ, uh, ended up attending the Sustainable Environment Commission meeting on June 16th to discuss potentially a, a unified recommendation. Really didn't want two separate recommendations coming from the two uh, separate commissions. Uh, from that meeting there was quite a bit of discussion on the topic and SEC ultimately recommended that PNZ continue with the draft ordinance uh, which would address safety and aesthetic concerns and then the SEC would go ahead and continue to research and monitor the legal landscape that's pretty consistently changing right now on those emissions for radio frequency and potential health effects. And then at some point, if there's an avenue that opens up uh, to put forth a recommendation to potentially address some health concerns, uh, if FCC changes the uh, certainly the threshold uh, or some other lawsuits end up um, you know, going forward, uh, we could certainly take a look at that in the future and maybe recommend a change to council at that point. And so with that, uh, staff's recommendation is just to recommend forwarding the proposed ordinance to public hearing at the council's upcoming October 19th uh, meeting, uh, which it's been noticed for public hearing. That I'd certainly be able to answer any questions that you might have. Committee, do you have any questions? Good. I've heard this one a few times, so go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, I mean, there's honestly, there's, I, I feel like more detail as we're getting comment and looking through packets, and even up until just recently today, I, uh, 
I feel more than can be asked or addressed, right? And this is appropriate for right here. I mean, some things that have been brought forward uh, about the ordinance are specific, just like wording, consistency kinds of things. And others are questions that I might have too. I'm not sure the best, um, the most appropriate avenue for that. Uh, it seems if we could maybe have some process for working through some things before the 19th, if we have feedback on the draft ordinance, I'm not sure. Um, well, certainly the way we've handled it at Planning and Zoning Commission, you know, a lot of the uh, comments appear to be grammatical and we certainly, you know, this has certainly been vetted by our city attorney and legal department. And so, you know, we, what we've typically done in the past with planning and zoning is that I've just gone through all the grammatical uh, comments and then just changed those as, I, as we saw fit. So and what, so, but, like if any have come in just from citizens in the last couple of days, even, just even with grammatical things, is that something we can just forward to you to take a look at? Certainly can, sure. Yeah, I mean, it, throughout the last year we've been getting, I know David has submitted uh, a lot of those comments and, and uh, Ms. Cheney as well. And we've uh, ended up making a lot of those changes in the ordinance that you see. I mean, it's been through several iterations of a lot of grammatical comments and wording mm -hmm. and strengthening cool. some sections. And so, um, you know, pretty much over the last year, we've, we've kind of through, gone through this continual cycle of, of trying to improve the ordinance and get it to a, a level where we, you know, think is gonna be the, the best fit. Okay. Um, I, I do have a question about the zoning aspect of it because it looked it appeared in one section at one point you had it uh, specific to like residential zones weren't a part of it but that was struck out and now residential zones are but I may be not interpreting the different it usually just applies to the macro cell facilities so okay. so small cell facilities uh, it's just going to be a conditional use permit if it's a new facility, standalone facility throughout the city. If they're co-location and they meet the specific, you know, they don't exceed the certain dimensional requirements, uh, and co-location is allowed entirely through uh, the city is what we, we have proposed. So it doesn't draw a distinction between residential and commercial zones. Can there be a distinction with the small cell wireless? Uh, you know, I think in reviewing this with our city attorney, I don't think so. I mean, there really it has to come down to aesthetic concerns. Mm -hmm. So we can't draw a distinction based upon health effects. And so why you would not allow it in residential areas where you have this large population and but allow it in commercial areas, there'd have to be some type of tie to aesthetics in those areas. And then you also have a lot of utility providers that we currently don't have any aesthetic requirements for. So. Um, I think I've kind of quoted, we have a legal opinion that I've attached as well from mm -hmm. Mia. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the section that covers aesthetics. You know, looking at that declaratory ruling, we're able to consider and address aesthetics, but the ruling concluded that aesthetic requirements are not preempted if they are one, reasonable, two, no more burdensome than those applied to the types of infrastructure developments, and three, objective and publish, published in advance. So, you know, currently right now, we don't have any other standards for any of the other utility providers. So I think it's, you know, we have to be cognizant of that and uh, be careful in that regard. Mm -hmm. I just, and I, I don't know the answer to this. I'm just wondering about uh, since they, by design, are required to be a higher density of them, that that could be an aesthetic issue in a residential location where the other, uh, telecommunications because they are farther, fewer and farther between would not have as much of an aesthetic impact. Well, I think you'd have a lot more frequency of utility poles than you would small cell. I mean, usually the range is 500 to 1,000 feet. That's about a city block. And so you, typically every intersection you have a light pole uh, just for safety. And then you have multiple utility poles that carry power throughout that entire mm -hmm. block. So I think the prevalence of all the rest of the utility providers is gonna be a lot more than any type of small cell uh, installation that you'd see. Um, what about in neighborhoods that have underground utilities? Because then we'd be talking about building a structure right. for these. Right. Certainly, um, 
you know, I, there's certain areas where <laughs> that could be acceptable, but you know, like at the bottom of uh, your screen there, the city attorneys addressed that as well. Um, you know, imposing regulation that all infrastructure be deployed underground would likely amount to effective prohibition and not permitted, but there could be certain circumstances. I mean, you do have light poles, those aren't underground. It's, it's a lot of the uh, franchise utilities that would be underground. Imposing a regulation that all infrastructure be deployed underground would likely amount to an effective prohibition and not permanent. Okay, I'm just processing that sure. opinion from the attorney. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I suppose the question would be not requiring it to be underground, but there could be an aesthetic. The case could be made that that is an aesthetic issue in a neighborhood that did not previously have above ground things and now will as a result of it. I don't know that. Well, I think, you know, a lot of the other utility providers like Avista are still gonna have light poles in that neighborhood and it's not gonna be any more frequency than a small cell application. So I don't think we can just draw a distinction there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a lot of proposed design standards as far as how large the cantenna on top can be, how large the shrouds can be. You know, we have none of these other standards to any of the utility providers, so I think we have to be careful there right. uh, in that regard. So then in that example, they would be mounted on the existing light poles? Is what They could, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really any antenna uh, co-location, antenna support structure. So it's really any structure that wasn't originally intended to to house some type of antenna. Could there be, or uh, is there, you listed the three different um, categories of installations. And it seems that installing on an existing structure would be preferable to building a new structure. There we go, thank you. So. Is there any way to have wording that would say, you know, they kind of aren't required to go in this order? Like if one cannot be met because there is no structure, then you go to two, then you go to three. For example, can there be a prioritization? Well, we, we, we or? Certainly, yeah, I mean, throughout our telecommunications ordinance, um, we've definitely encouraged and prioritized the co-location. You know, and a lot of that applies to the macro cell where we require at least three uh, providers to have room on those towers in order to provide service. These are a little bit different just because how small they are. You know, a lot of times you can't physically fit and maybe you don't have enough power and fiber optic demand to fit multiple providers on one pole. So that's, you know, unless, I mean, you see some of the other ordinances that are directing their priority to different zones, which doesn't really have any teeth. And so I don't know that why we would put our preference in the code if we couldn't enforce it. Right. Yeah, I'm just, and I don't know if this would happen. I, I don't know enough about what makes sense for the companies, but if they came and said, we want to build these uh, freestanding units, However, there are existing light poles that could accommodate them. Is there any mechanism here where it could be said, uh, since we have these existing, we require that? You can only build the new ones if there's, there are no options that meet your needs. Well, I think with some of the existing, maybe they're of providers that don't want them on those poles. You know, I think it's hard if we solely owned all the poles in town, it may be a little bit different to point to that, but I think that that would be problematic. I mean, the new poles, we do implement uh, a dimensional standard. They can't be located within 250 feet of another completely freestanding small cell wireless pole. So we do have that dimensional standard where they can't be closer than that to another exclusively freestanding pole. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking I know they may prefer to build their own. I, I guess that's what I'm wanting to consider. They may want prefer to build their own thing, but if we have something already in existence, maybe we prefer that that's where it be placed, even if it's not their preference. I mean, do we want to 
exert that preference as a city that if there's an option to mount on an existing structure this is our chance to put that in the ordinance i suppose so maybe that's just something i don't know you well, that you've makes been sense. On i hadn't thought about that part I was, I was digesting that as you said that um I, I would say it didn't come up at all that i recall in planning and zoning um there are a lot of things that came up but they didn't reach out to that one um i can see how that would be i can see how that could be a good addition just because that gives us a little more control of no you can't put up more structures that we don't need I think that's right. That's what it would correct. be if it, if there's an alternative, and we would prefer you to be on this existing structure that's already there, and you can be. I think it's probably going to be the natural tendency to look co-locate, just because it's going to be the cheapest option mm -hmm. most of the time. So I think they're just going to have this natural tendency to gravitate towards that option. But I, you know, certainly could visit with our city attorney to see if that's a possibility to specify that. I would be most comfortable with that because I hear and I, I, I resonate with the concept of we'd like them to kind of make it as invisible as possible, you know, on top of another existing. But, but it, I don't want to get into that prohibition either, making, an, making a statement that, that gets in any way classified as a prohibition that we can get in trouble for. Yeah. So, well, as yeah. Long, you know, I, I think that your, your gut is right, Mike, if there is a way that we could prioritize or or help prioritize but just so that it's legal i i don't want us to get into a prohibition moment yeah i think Nobody checking does. with the attorney to say uh would it be acceptable or fit within legal requirements to say if there is an existing structure that can accommodate it well it makes sense to me that they that might be the cheapest way for them to do it anyways, but I don't know. Um, so, it, and if it can be put in there, that if, if this can exist on an, be placed on an existing structure, then it must be rather than building a new structure. If it can't be, then you move to the next option. So it's not prohibiting them, but sure. I think check in with the attorney. Sure. Yeah, I agree. I think your 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 moment of question about whether or not the owner of the existing structure will allow that is a is a key statement. I don't I would not be comfortable with us dictating that that the owner of the structure always allow co-location if they don't want it. So if that negates what we're talking about here then I guess I'd probably fall on the wrong side of that one, but um yeah, maybe just a little bit more discovery. If we could please okay. so does that mean then if a vista owns the pole that they can say no to this certainly no. yeah mike this didn't come up and it just popped into my head as we're talking about all of this um when we're talking about aesthetics i know we we're really looking at lots of potential ugliness just coming from a lot of different things on structures but is there anything in there or do we need to even think about the advertising aspect of this? Like, are we gonna have a giant pink T-Mobile and a giant yellow or big words saying whoever they are? I mean. We have a portion of the ordinance that prohibits signage okay. except for um, some type of emergent, you know, some, some type of hazard type signage. Even color? That's even color? as far as the color of the sign. Well, I'm just thinking that, you know, some groups, I, again, I'm thinking of T-Mobile and their bright pink. They love to put their bright pink all over. So if you have a structure that's bright pink and up on something that's an eyesore, but it might not say who they are, but everyone identifies by that color. Yeah, we require the poles to be a certain color. Okay, but, thank you. And that usually powder coated black for new poles, so. Great. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I do have one more. I just want to clarify that I'm understanding correctly from, um, I did read through the attorney's memo once, but once is not enough for me right now. Um, so was it her conclusion that you cannot exclude residential zone? Or is that more the thought that that would be inconsistent with other telecommunications? 
I don't think she specifically stated that we couldn't exclude it. Um, but just in review of, of other ordinances and just the, her, her legal opinion about draw, not drawing a distinction between other utility providers and only being able to regulate aesthetics and not health concerns, I couldn't come up with any reason why we would prohibit those in residential areas. Um, oh, and thank you for sending along the Pullman draft ordinance, and I uh, have not entirely made my way through that either, but do you know if they restrict uh, placement in residential zones in their draft ordinance? I know it's just in that draft stage. They oh, don't. Do. I believe the only area where they've restricted or proposed to restrict are city parks. Okay, and are we restricting it in city parks in this draft ordinance? No, we're not. Yeah, the majority of our telecommunications equipment is actually in city parks on water towers throughout the city. You know, it's usually the highest point in residential areas. And so, you know, looking at the traditional 3G, 4G, that's where they've traditionally been located on the sides of the railing. So, yeah, so. So in Pullman, they have them in the parks existing. However, in their draft ordinance, they don't want the small uh, wireless to be permitted in parks. Is that correct? And I'm kind of curious Pullman's, what that's about. I've not read Pullman's ordinance, but they're certainly free to do that as long as they don't unreasonably restrict right. access to these companies to provide 5G. Mm -hmm. And whether, um, and I don't know if Mia is on this call or not, she might be able to answer the residential issue, um, or at least we'll have an answer for you by next Monday. But yeah. I think the whole issue, at least in my readings on this, and I've talked to Mia about it and you have her memo, is that the feds have essentially preempted us except in those very limited circumstances. Mm -hmm. They want to promote this. They want to promote that telecommunications. So, um, and they've been, uh, we've talked in the past about how some cities have taken the position that they're going to fight that. That's been something that um, on a national scale has not been successful so far. Um, so we're limited to what we can do. I'm sure if Pullman excluded city parks, it's because there is sufficient ability for them to provide other opportunities for those providers if they so chose. And it's going to be a matter of economics at any rate. In fact, I just had a conversation with, with Bill earlier today that, you know, 5G is set up so that you need a population to use it. Mm -hmm. So whether it will ever get out in residential zones is a matter of some conjecture. Uh, usually the advertisements you're seeing on TV now are, you know, 5G, usually in metro areas, that's where they'll start out and then it may trickle out into residential, but we have no way of knowing that and the federal government has made it clear, the FCC, that we are not to restrict that either. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I appreciate that what this is doing is creating some uh, requirements that currently don't exist at all. So I appreciate the foresight and working on this so that there is something in place and I understand the, the challenge of what restrictions can be there, can't be there. And I know PNZ has been working <laughs> very hard and with the attorney's advice on that. So I think overall, this is definitely, you know, the sooner we get something where we currently have nothing, the better. So yeah. um, I think it's also just that opportunity to try to make it as comprehensive as we possibly can, given that as a local municipality, there are a lot of things we can't do. I, I would like to just see us make sure that we try to include as much that we can have some impact on, which is where I'm coming from and asking sure. the questions about. Certainly. Um, parks, for example, uh, you know, given that we're talking about for this to really work, very frequent needing to use those light poles and the utility poles, uh, perhaps the structures that right now make sense in the parks are somewhat irrelevant because just one, one small cell on there is not going to do anything without them being all around those parks too. So. I don't know if that's something that PNZ considered or if SEC considered it. Um, but we didn't talk about parks at all that I recall. Do you, Mike? 
We brought it up early on, and so we've already gone through a lot of the discussion about residential zones and other city facilities. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, we were just really the the commission's been taking the, our legal advice from our city attorney on this mm -hmm. regard. So, oh. is it do you, do you uh, recall any particular reason not to exclude them from parks? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, I can't recall a, a specific reason. Yeah, why, I know yeah. it's been in discussions for a long time. So, <laughs> okay. I, I guess I'm not concerned about parks. Is there, is there a concern in your head about parks that maybe I'm missing? Um, well, I think, um, you know, we can't consider health mm -hmm. issues um, legally. There certainly are people with health okay. concerns, yeah. and I think the your input about SEC wanting to be able to revisit this if standards change, if more is learned about uh, uh, thresholds that, or if FCC rulings change by in the result of some of these lawsuits to where then cities can control some things due to health reasons. So knowing that there is still um, some interest in having that ability were we to be permitted to in the future, it makes me think, well, if there's um, anything that fits within our legal authority at this point, parks are one of the areas that would be a gotcha. particular yep health so, concern if there are health issues that are discovered in the future just because it's a public yeah. place where children are. So these aren't set in stone though, what we're doing. We can always go back and change as we get more data, correct? Certainly. Yeah, as data is generated and as rules are clarified right. and if the FCC allows municipalities right. to have a greater regulatory presence than we do now. Right. Right. You recall, this is not the first time this has happened. Oh. We have uh, the Telecommunications Act when it uh, came out, regulated cable TV, for instance, was something where they took almost all of the city's ability except for premium channels, or excuse me, except for basic channels was the only thing where previously we regulated everything. They cut it back to where we had like 13 channels that we could regulate. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just a matter of the federal government trying to put forth a, forth a, a national policy that provides that network, communication network uh, across the nation. So that's, that's kind of what's going on here. But it, again, if something comes up where they say, okay, this is something we hadn't thought of or we're deregulating, then of course, local government can step in and do what it needs to do at that point. Mm -hmm. I would sincerely, while, while um, no one's input is unimportant, I would sincerely hate us to get into a position of regulating and ending up biting off our nose to spite our face, where, where we may find out that we need desperately, for some reason, telecommunication apparatus in the parks. I would hate us to be preemptive and, and um, you know, I think we can always, we can always build on what we have here. And I think it's been a, a long process and a good job, but I don't think it has to be as comprehensive as possible right now. I think we don't know enough to start making some bigger sweeping. Well, and if additions. I may add as please, well. Please, please. Again, I can't s speak for Pullman, not having been involved or even read it, but it would seem to me that they must have some other way to allow providers to provide that should they want, and it's not been litigated either. So yeah. the prohibition is something that hasn't even been enacted yet. So mm -hmm. who knows what the issue is. Yeah. Did you have something you were? No, I was just oh. pondering. That was my ponderous Yeah, slip. okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know about this either, but maybe if it was a middle ground of a conditionally permitted use in parks where it wouldn't be a situation where now we 
find we have a need for it and we have no way to fit it in with the way the ordinance is. I mean, you can always rewrite it as we were talking about in the other direction if we were to make it more restrictive, but maybe making it conditionally permitted. As I'm sure your land use gentleman will tell you in a second, you need to have what conditions under which you yeah. would allow it. So if, again, if it's to health, which is a prohibited measure, you couldn't use that for a condition that had to be met. So they'd have to be aesthetic or some of the other very limited areas. Not trying to discourage yeah, the no, council no. from being as comprehensive as possible, but uh, I know PNZ did a very comprehensive look at this and what other jurisdictions are doing, um, I can't say. Right. Well, so our action today is to recommend forwarding to the whole council. <laughs> I think that goes without saying. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, and, and I think that, I think um, your question earlier, Brandy, about some of the additional feedback um, from, from the public, you know, maybe it does just go to you and then just be ready on the 19th because there'll be quite the, quite the conversation. I think. What do you, the other balance of the committee, what, you is know, your, what are your thoughts? I will say that, I mean, there, I, there's definitely been a lot of discussion about this. Um, mm -hmm. I think this was the first discussion I sat in on when I joined planning and zoning was 5G. And I will say a lot of the questions always came down to, it's about health and we can't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. And we're required by the federal government to do this. So, I mean, but you, yeah. you brought up an interesting point about parks and where those can be placed. I know we talked about, can they go on historical buildings? Can they stick out? How are you gonna make this aesthetically pleasing? I mean, round and round and round about that. And and um, I feel like, I really feel like Mike and the group did a great job of coming up with exactly what can be done. I appreciated that planning and zoning went to, to our attorney several times, like we need clarification on this. And she was great and kept giving us answers. So. Um, yeah, I think there will be discussion, but I think a lot of those questions have been answered and we'll just answer them again, right? Um, it's been, I will say it's been a hard process um, and an agonizing one, really. I watched the Planning and Zoning Commission go through this and I mean, there were a lot of things that kind of, that are bothersome and there were a lot of things that were bothersome to me too, but we were really um, handcuffed by what we were allowed and not allowed to do. So um, listening to him like oh yeah i remember that oh i remember that and so um it, it is tough and i think there will be a lot of public comment a lot of the comment that we received earlier had to be about health concerns um and i think we have all as counselors we've seen that i know planning and zoning got a lot of those and uh and it's where to put them on buildings that was the other big issue because they are so close together but mike has uh, given several presentations on how that goes up and where they are i i I'd advise uh, visiting with him a little bit more because I've certainly learned a lot in all those commission meetings. And I have the opportunity of doing that like every two weeks and this came up all but like twice. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I think I'm, the things I'm specifically referring to are some recent input that recognizes that this is, cannot be about health things. So it's within the legal bounds, but still some just minor suggestions mm -hmm. to uh, perhaps uh, just improve upon the ordinance itself, not in any big major ways, but still that, that fit within the bounds of, and these are you know individuals understanding sure. the, the limitations, but um, maybe I can just visit with you certainly. a little bit yeah, and then um, just to give a little feed share some of those things and see I, I think a lot of them are minor again i know that you've been through a lot of iterations of wording but then you get new eyes on it and yeah. there's that's new fine. people yeah, pick that's up completely some other fine. Little things. I, i'd be happy to um i did notice too that the uh it, it appeared that planning and zoning did add or you added the the section um about having the qualified engineer have the city having the authority to have them check the um 
You mentioned the yeah, we, frequency. Yeah, we strengthened that, that section yeah. uh, at the public hearing uh, last time before PNZ. Uh, yeah. David certainly submitted that comment numerous times as well as Ms. Cheney, and so that was one of the results of public comment being introduced into the ordinance. So. Yeah, so that was, I think that was great to see, very responsive too. It's uh, just still saying, you know, that a, a way to ensure that it is within the current guidelines of what the FCC or, or has determined is acceptable levels, regardless of whether you agree with it or not, just having a mechanism to be able to follow up on that. Yeah. Um, it, it is a perfect example to me of a way to strengthen this still within uh, the legal bounds. Sure. So. Okay. okay. All right, so I'm going to assume, listening to the three of us, and I'd like to hear from the two of you as well, that we recommend forwarding this proposed ordinance for public hearing at the October 19th meeting. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Thank that you. is a thick topic for sure. Um, that is the last item on our agenda, barring a construction project update from Mr. Belknap. Good afternoon. Hello there, Bill. Well, I'll try to make this quick. We've got about 15 minutes, I believe. Let's see. There we are. Okay. So as we wind down the construction season this year, we want to provide an update and report on the status of the number of capital projects the city has been working on this year. Uh, the largest of which has been the A Street project. Uh, so approximately, oh, about a four block section of A Street uh, from Home Street to Peterson, including Line Up and Circle Drive has been one of our largest roadway and reconstruction projects this year. Um, that project has now, both Thursday and Friday of last week, they were busily working on paving. A fairly large project, um, largely because of the topography of the site, the adjacent retaining walls, you can kind of see those pictured on the north side of A Street in this photograph, that had to be constructed to address the road grades widening to allow for the installation of the travel lanes, on-street parking, sidewalks, and so forth. Uh, that project, A Street and Lion, are largely paved. There is some paved back into private individual driveways. Um, we still have a fair amount of concrete work yet to be completed. As you can see in the picture, all the curb work retaining walls are largely in place. We've got about 40% of the sidewalks have been installed. Um, so we've got about 60% yet remaining that need to get installed. And then we have some, some final touch-up and paving up on Circle Drive. That project is tentatively scheduled for completion by the end of this month. We've got a construction meeting on Thursday of this week to go over uh, striping layouts and getting that in place and timing of opening the project. But between the concrete and street tree installations, we still have a little bit of work left to, to be done. So our hope is for that roadway to be open either by the last week of this month or the first week of November. Um, but that is, has been progressing well. Another reconstruction project we had this year was the Almond Street reconstruction, so that uh, rebuilt Almond Street from 3rd Street all the way up to A Street. And we also picked up 1st Street from Almond over to Jackson. Uh, probably one of our worst roadway surface conditions in the city, um, so that, was, that project uh, went well, has been completed, and is now open for access. Uh, we did uh, can reconfigure uh, Almond Street to be two-way traffic, really from A Street to 1st, and then it converts then to the first uh, one-way northbound from 1st Street down to 3rd. Um, so that's the curb bulb extension at that transition on the traffic. However, uh, that project turned out very well uh, in addition. Uh, that was a partnership between the city and the Moscow Urban, Urban Rural Agency. The agency contributed $150,000 towards uh, that individual project. Uh, we also had the C and Main Street beautification. So this is some surrounding hardscape improvements uh, that we completed in conjunction with the public art installation at that intersection. So we had some sidewalk improvements, curb replacements uh, in that area, actually on the south side. So right there at the tip of the Moscow Medical, we uh, constructed this new planter bed, some new street trees elements. Uh, so this was a location that was identified in the city's 2015 beautification plan as being one of those kind of the north uh, gateway feature of Main Street. Uh, so we wanted to make some of those improvements in conjunction with the installation of the public art. 
Uh, we did new sidewalk along the the habitat store frontage which had a number of old abandoned driveways that were not ADA compliant and in very poor condition and we actually uh, added curb bulbs there at the intersection on the east side of C Street intersection to try to improve that pedestrian crossing as well um, and then we did although it doesn't really turn out very well in any of these photos you can see kind of a hint of red we had a paved landscape island um, that was located there we did a thermal plastic treatment to it to give it a faux kind of red brick treatment it helped kind of really improve add some color to the area in conjunction with a public art installation uh, so that project actually went very well as well uh, the water building is progressing so all the structural repairs are now complete as you can see the cribbing has been removed from supporting those perimeter glue lamp beams and so we're now just to doing some finish up work on the roofing flashing details around the perimeter of the roof structure uh, so that should be wrapped up here in about three to four weeks that project should be fully complete and ready for reoccupancy uh, we also began phase two of well 10. Uh, so the initial phase was in 2016 that included the drilling of the well. Phase two then was going to include the pumps and control systems, the pump house and connect it to the city's water distribution system. Uh, so the contractor has been uh, working on advanced underground utilities, stormwater extensions and improvements, retaining walls, and now the construction of the pump house as you can see in the photograph so we're on to the roof truss structure so they're working hard to get that uh, dried in uh, that project is scheduled for completion by uh, spring of next year uh, but also going well according to schedule Uh, then the other project we have underway is the construction of a new police services facility at the intersection of South Main and Southview. Uh, so all of the underground utility work, subgrade uh, work has been completed. Uh, the main building steel is being erected right now. And they're working on getting exterior site improvements wrapped up before we get into the winter months. So that, prog that project is on schedule. Uh, we anticipate substantial completion date for that facility to be in early uh, or I guess the end of June of 2021 is our substantial completion date. Um, so you can see the main building here located uh, showing the erection of the steel. Uh, there's the foundation slab for the outbuilding here on the left side of your screen as well. A couple of small park projects we had. Uh, the Rotary Park playground pad structure uh, was completed. Uh, so that set the foundation for the new structure that will be installed at the park. We also had the construction of the Tawny Park pathway. Uh, to provide a connection between Crestview and Atani Drive and provide access to Atani Park. So that project was wrapped up and completed. And then this year, the sidewalk program, as the council saw here just in the last meeting for the bid award, uh, we did this one as a fall project this year. Uh, we've had difficulty in the spring months, in, in the spring bidding season of getting good pricing on this project and getting availability of contractors. So we did a fall bid on this one. One of the large projects that will be included in that is the installation of a, a pathway here at uh, Hordeman's Pond. And so you can see there, you've got the pathway. I should probably keep using the uh, mouse here as a pointer. So this is the existing pathway here. This is Eisenhower Street and Hordeman's Pond is on the top of the screen. So the pathway here that goes behind Good Sam and then ultimately out to Mountain View Park comes in and essentially enters Eisenhower. We'll have a new crossing with a continuation of the pathway to provide access here to Hortons Pond and then a continuation to connect to the existing sidewalk uh, located to the north of the site. Um, so along with the Hortons Park project, we have a number of other um, city projects include replacement of non-compliant ADA ped ramps. There's one in Elm in Idaho, as well as a replacement of another sidewalk panel in that location. Some additional ped ramps at the Moore and D streets that was a result of a request for accommodation for an individual with a physical disability in that area. We also had a request for to add a ped ramp at the Rolling Hills Drive in Atani where there were an a, a existing sidewalk just dead ended and there was no ped ramp out to the street. That'll be added as well. And then we have a couple panels here over on Washington Street that are fairly significant tripping hazards that will, will also get taken care of there as part of that project as well. And then our one now remaining, we had two at the time of bid award for the council approval. Um, one of the two property owners decided not to participate this year. And so uh, the one that's remaining is the largest one that we had in the project. 
which is on 6th Street, that was the All Souls Church, um, need to extend, uh, replace um, a section of sidewalk, about 51 feet of sidewalk in front of their property. So they will be continuing, that will be constructed as part of the sidewalk program this year. Another one I wanted to talk about briefly is we, uh, we've been working on a downtown concrete uh, grinding project. We all know we're gonna hopefully begin discussions about downtown hardscape uh, replacement here this upcoming year in plans for a future project, potentially in 2022 or 2023. In the interim, we still have some fairly significant tripping hazards exist throughout the downtown area. We did an inventory and identified the the, the worst areas of town uh, on Main Street to try to address with a temporary grinding. We've done this about every four years or so. We did, I think, in 2012 and again, I think about 2016. Uh, so we have a, about a $20,000 scope of work to do grinding of some of those tripping hazards on Main Street. So that activity will be beginning uh, coming up on the week of the 26th and should take about a week to complete. Uh, but this, this is some kind of pictures of showing what that looks like after once those tripping hazards have been removed again to try to help uh, address those issues until we have a, a longer term project identified for replacement of hardscape downtown. Uh, looking ahead to 2021, we have a number of projects on the list. So we will be back to our surface treatment program. We did not do any surface treatments this year. Those would be our slurry seals or rubberized chip seal projects. Uh, because of the A Street project and some of the cost increases we had there. So we'll be back to doing our surface treatment program next year. We have about 200,000 programmed for that for 2021. We also had the reconstruction of Lily and First Street as a project on the list for construction. And then we have our local highway safety improvement uh, program projects on 3rd and 6th Street. So that includes the sidewalk replacement uh, really on 3rd from Jackson all the way to Llewellyn. And then a couple areas on 6th Street along that same kind of similar corridor, lighting improvements and other additions. So that'll be for, for construction next year as well. And then the 6th Street Bridge will probably be our largest project next year. Uh, so that'll be the replacement and reconstruction of a new bridge structure at 6th Street near Mountain View. Uh, we have a few other projects that will be moving into design in 2021. So we'll have the next LSIP project, which is the Public Avenue Safety Project that is on Public Avenue from Polk up to Lincoln. So we'll be working on design in 2021. Construction of that will be in 2022. We also have uh, street reconstruction on F Street from Public uh, to Lincoln. Um, that'll be also in design for 2021 and construction in 2022. And then in White Avenue pavement restoration, that's from the Troy Highway all, to Mount, all the way to Mountain View, will also be in design in 2021. And then for uh, we'll be wrapping up the Mountain View project from Joseph to 6th Street, be wrapping up both design and right away acquisition in 2021. So those will be our more substantial street projects in 21. Water system, we'll have our Thorn Creek Advanced Utilities ahead of the US 95 South project, uh, the Indian Hills water main construction, and then moving into boosters phase two. So there'll be two booster stations, one at Indian Hills Drive, and the other up on Ponderosa. Those will be our two last remaining booster station reconstructions. We have some Southeast Reservoir Booster ATS automatic transfer switch back at power generation improvements as well at the reservoir there. And then we'll be moving into design for the reconstruction of well, well number six, well house, the Taylor Booster Station loop upgrade, a Plus Mall water main replacement and the Pullman Highway transmission project. So those last four will be designed of 2021 for construction in 2022. And on sewer, we have again, advanced utilities ahead of the Thorn Creek project, continuation of our manhole replacement and treatment program. And then we have a couple uh, sewer mains replaced, one seventh to sixth that supports Gritman Medical Center, another one in Morton and Adams. And then we have another one Lincoln and the University Heights will be in design for 2021. And then lastly, our parks projects, we have our Mountain View Connector Path, uh, Gormley Park Pickleball Courts will be in construction in 2021, and the Good Samaritan Pathway Repair Project. That's a section of pathway there, really from Eisenhower to almost the first turn of the pathway there that either was damaged both during the flooding event of 2019 and also has some root intrusion issues that has caused some damage. So we have a fairly large uh, pathway reconstruction project there. We'll also be working on our Paradise Path uh, Phase 1 lighting project from US 95 or South Main uh, to Berman Creekside Park, and then be begin design on the Mountain View Park restroom ADA remodel. 
Um, we have packaged a mountain view if we were successful in the community development block grant to this list, we would do the Mountain View connector path, we would do the Mountain View ADA remodel, we'd also do the Indian Hills bathroom installation and on-street ADA parking installation if we're successful in the grant as well. So, just a quick update <laughs> on status of projects for this year Very and efficient. what we'll be seeing <laughs> coming up soon. The only Good question stuff. I had from someone recently is, will there be a ribbon cutting when A Street is open? <laughs> I doubt we'll be able to pull that together. Yeah, that, <laughs> I think people are pretty eager to have the roadway open. Pretty difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. You are welcome. It. Okay, girls, we're adjourned, committee. All right, we're done. Four minutes past when we're supposed to. <laughs>